Hello once again. It is great to be with you. Um, hopefully you had a wonderful Christmas and a great celebration of the new year. Um, if you're following this at all in sequence um, here at church um, for our congregation, if you're one, um, if you're watching this a few months later, that greeting may not make much sense, but we just had uh, Christmas and uh, New Year's here. So this is our first Bible study after a couple of weeks off. We're going to pick up at Matthew chapter four today. Let's begin with prayer and then we'll get into our study today. We pray. Dear Lord God, thank you for the blessings that you give us for the opportunity once again to be in your word. Send us your Holy Spirit so that we may grow grow in our understanding of you, of your word, of your will for us in our lives. We ask for all these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so grab um, your Bible or just follow along. I've got the, the passages for you here. We're going to begin, though, with a little bit of review. I need to get our PowerPoint pulled up here, and then we will be ready to go. All right. So Matthew, the word of God is fulfilled, is our theme that we have been following. And let's look at a little bit of review from last time. And don't feel bad if you didn't read or watch our, our previous ones or don't have Matthew 3 fresh in your mind. Um, but just a little bit of review so we can kind of get the wheels turning again and what Matthew's all about. So last time was a lot about John the Baptist. So what was the main message that John the Baptist proclaimed? Was it A, repent? Was it B, reflect? Was it C, relax? Or was it D, rejoice? Got a little bit of a theme there, don't we? Repent, reflect, relax, rejoice. John the Baptist said what? Primarily, it was repent. Maybe you could say there's a reason to rejoice because the Savior is coming. But um, yeah, his was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. We heard a little bit about John's clothing and his diet. Um, his clothing was made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. Does that imply that he was A, a crazy man, B, a manly man, <laughs> eating those bugs? Only a manly man would do that. Was he a common man? Was he a wealthy man? The answer there would be yes, that he was a common man or a maybe a, a man who lived off the land. Um, these would have been staples of his diet and what he wore um, for somebody in his position. So yeah, not that he was crazy or a wild man, but probably was a common man with a very special message. And who appeared at Jesus' baptism? John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. There were some special guests who appeared. Were they A, the Pharisees and Sadducees? Was it B, Peter and Andrew? Was it C, the devil and his angels? Or was it D, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit? The answer there is, shout it out. Answer is D, God the Father was there. Um, this is my son, with him I am well pleased, the Holy Spirit in the form of the dove. Last one, Jesus said that he needed to be baptized by John. Remember, John said, I don't know about this. You, I need to be baptized by you, not you by me. Jesus said, we need to do this. Why? A, to fulfill all righteousness. B, to wash away his sins. C, to set an example for others. Or D, to identify with a world of sinners. This is the tricky one. I'll admit that. Tricky one, and maybe I'm not playing by the rules, um, because the answer is A, to fulfill all righteousness. But I would say um, part of that, that Jesus being baptized was, part of fulfilling all righteousness was to set an example for others. And he was also identifying with a world of sinners by living under the law, just as every other person. So that was really an unfair question. But first and foremost, it was A. That was the words of Jesus. It's necessary to do this to fulfill all righteousness. But I think in point A, I think C and D are a factor of that as well. 
All right, trick question, not fair, not fair. But let's get into today's lesson. Matthew chapter four, verses one through 11 is where we are picking up today. Like I said, grab your Bible or just follow along. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil after fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Understandably, Jesus was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. So for our lesson today, we are going to focus on just this one portion of scripture because there's enough in here that I felt like we needed to cover in our short half hour that would fill us, uh, fill up our time. So just these 11 verses. So what was temptation number one? It was stones to be turned into bread. I thought that was kind of a cool picture that was found. Um, turn those stones into bread was the, the temptation. So think about that. Jesus was fasting in the desert for 40 days. You have to understand that he would have been incredibly weak and hungry. And the devil says, why not just do this, Jesus? Why not just turn the, the stones into bread? The number 40 in the, in the Bible is fascinating, too. I had a list here of all of the 40s. Um, so there was uh, 40 days and 40 nights that the flood um, rained down from heaven. There were 40 years in the wilderness. Um, for the children of Israel, Moses was on Sinai for 40 days. Elijah fasted for 40 days. Jonah preached to Nineveh 40 more days, and the city will be overturned. Jesus lived on earth for 40 more days after Easter, before his ascension. What is the deal with 40? I don't know. How about that for an answer? But it's there a lot. God likes the number 40, apparently. And maybe when we go to heaven, he'll explain it and he'll say, this is obvious. But um, 40 days was his period of fasting. So we've got three temptations listed here, but probably likely that the devil was assaulting him the whole time, that it was not just three temptations that the devil threw at Jesus, um, but different temptations the whole time seems to be the, the picture there. Jesus was led by the Spirit, um, but also understand that in being led by the Spirit, Jesus is willingly going through this. So, and it is interesting to start his ministry. Um, Jesus is baptized, and like the very first thing that happens, boom, he's tempted. So it's like the devil is just trying to um, thwart him from the very beginning, and the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into this. Maybe just um, welcome to um, your work. You know, this is what you're going to have to do. And it was kind of a, a literal baptism, but also a, a baptism of suffering and uh, temptation that Jesus immediately goes into. Why not turn the stones into bread? What would have been so horrible? Um, Jesus is hungry. He could have done it, obviously. God provided bread many times. Jesus turned bread into more bread with the feeding of the 5,000. Um, so what's the big deal? Why not? Well, I think there are different aspects we can point out here, um, things to take note of. One is that all along, so Jesus has this period of temptation, he's relying on his heavenly father to provide for him. And what would it be saying if suddenly the devil shows up and says, if you are the son of God, 
tell these to become bread, which would imply what? Your heavenly father's really not taking care of you. He's not going to provide for you and strengthen you and get you through this. So it was um, really an, a temptation to not trust the will of his heavenly father, even though I have to admit, it seems to me to be um, not the greatest temptation, I mean, is, or the greatest kind of sin, but it would have been, and it certainly would have been for Jesus, um, because this was the, the role that he had undertaken, and the devil saying, yeah, you really can't trust your heavenly father. You, you can't trust him to do what is best. And this seems funny to say, too, and it seems funny to me to even write it, to say this was a selfish act. Um, it's not selfish to have something to eat and not starve yourself, of course. But for what Jesus is doing here, um, this would have been something entirely for him. And we don't have any miracle in the Bible where Jesus performs that miracle just to benefit himself, right? Or to, or to benefit himself in any way. Instead... Jesus was hungry, and Jesus was tired, and Jesus was thirsty, and he went to that well in John's gospel, and he needed the bucket to get down. And other, you know, So he didn't use his power as God to selfishly provide for himself. Um, there were probably nights where Jesus needed an extra blanket, and he didn't just go, you know, miracle. Um, when he was hungry, where he didn't just go, lamb steak and plate of vegetables. Um, so Jesus did not use miracles in a selfish way. He used miracles to heal, to bless others, to cast out demons, and they were always directed for others. So it would have been a selfish act in that way. And like I just said, Jesus never performed miracles for his own comfort or ease. And I just think about, if I had power like that, oh my goodness how selfish I would be, right? Just me so quickly coming up with, I need a blanket, right? I want this, I want that, I need money. Um, the, like the genie in the bottle, you know, if you had three wishes kind of stuff, what would you do? And what, what do we always think? Well, me, me, and me, I, I, I would do that. Sure, I would help people too. I mean, in being the, the richest person in the world, think about all the people I could help, right? <laughs> So what a mess I would make of the, the same kind of power that Jesus had, but he didn't, and he didn't succumb to the temptation of the devil here. And I do think that word if is so important too, and it, and it appears in all three temptations. It's, it's not like the devil is saying, you are the son of God, you can do this. I, I, I do think that's important, but he's saying if, he's questioning it. Which is like uh, his first temptation. Um, if God is really loving, um, can you trust him to provide for you and to do what's best? If you really are the son of God, um, prove it. And Jesus was going to prove that he was the son of God, not by flexing his muscles and creating instant bread. He's going to prove that he's the son of God by defeating the devil with his death on the cross. That's why he was there. Um, to overcome the devil and not to fill his belly, empty as it was. Um, what else do we have there? Um, let me catch up on my sheet here. The devil's temptation of Jesus, um, about the temptation itself. The first temptation in the Bible involved food in a land of plenty. I came across this in a commentary today. I never thought about this. That's the great thing about reading um, other people's commentaries. So I just thought it was an interesting correlation. So the first temptation in the Bible involved food in a land of plenty. So Adam and Eve had everything. They had no food. They were not starving. They were not fasting. They didn't lack anything as far as food. And what did the, the what did the devil use? Um, this forbidden fruit, um, the the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's a mouthful right there, as we're talking about food. And the first temptation for Jesus, at least recorded here, was food, although it was entirely different. It was in a barren landscape, not filled with plenty. You know, Adam and Eve had the Garden of Eden. 
Eden, excuse me. They had everything that was good and beautiful and wonderful, and they had as much food as they want. Here, Jesus is hungry and he's tired and it's a desert and there is no food. So which temptation was greater? Well, you would have to say that Jesus was much greater with his hunger and with the lack of food, which all shows us again that the second Adam was so much greater than the first. The first Adam, our first parent, um, <clears throat> was not born in sin, but he gave up his purity and his righteousness when the devil tempted him with that food in a land of plenty. Jesus, the second Adam, refused to eat even when he was starving because he is the greater Adam, our, our second Adam, as sometimes Jesus is referred to. Or maybe our anti-Adam in that everything that Adam messed up, Jesus fulfilled completely. Adam couldn't resist temptation. You and I can't resist temptation entirely. Hopefully we do at times. But Jesus did and Jesus does. So he's everything Adam messed up, everything we messed up, Jesus keeps perfectly and completely for us, our perfect savior. Our temptations, um, the devil still lies, just to be aware of that. Of course he does. That's um, what he is. He is a liar and he is the father of lies that the Bible says. So the devil still tells his lies. And for some reason, um, we, still, we still trust him. Um, we still think that those lies. So if I just do this, it'll make me happy. And it doesn't matter if I'm disobeying God, if I just have more money. So I'll steal or I'll cheat or I'll lie. Um, if I commit adultery and I have this relationship with this person, that'll make me happy. That'll fulfill me. That's what I need. Um, whatever it is. And we still listen to his lies, right? And we think these things are going to make us happy or are going to make us enjoy life more, are going to fulfill us. And if it's not according to God's word, it's just a lie. And he's so good at it. Um, we face temptations. It's not a sin to be tempted. Otherwise, Jesus would be a sinner. Um, he was tempted. He never gave in to temptation. So, and uh, I was just thinking about this today. Maybe we think about temptations um, as evil things that we never encounter um, or that maybe that a Christian shouldn't have um, and we want them. So we go outside of ourselves. So we, we're going to steal or we're going to commit adultery or we're going to lie or whatever it might be. And, and those are the temptations. And certainly they are, of course. That's a huge part of temptations. But I was just thinking about this too. Maybe for the believer, more common temptations for us, not that the others don't, like I said, they do, but maybe good health is a, is a temptation. How? Well, what happens when you're strong and healthy? You're self-reliant, or you think you're invincible, or um, you don't pray, because why do I need to pray to God? I'm, I'm pretty tough, I'm pretty strong, I'm pretty healthy. Um, that's a temptation, isn't it? And it's a blessing. So what I guess I'm getting to here is sometimes we take things that are blessings, and they become a temptation too. Not just things that are overtly sinful that are temptations. Sometimes they're things God has given us because he's gracious, but they become a temptation. Your talent becomes a temptation. How so? Well, you're so wonderfully talented, right? And then what do we do? Well, look at me. You know, I'm pretty awesome. And we forget that we wouldn't have one single blessing or talent unless it was from the hand of our God unless he graciously gave it and, and it's undeserved. Um, so yeah, our talent can become a temptation to sin against God or success can be a, uh, just an ego feeder, right? We, we feed our egos and we pat ourselves on the back and man, I am really special and, and, and better than others. So um, yeah, I guess that's the point I'm trying to get to that temptation isn't just bad stuff that comes to us from the outside, but it may be things that we already have that are actually good, but they can lead us astray um, because of, of what we do with them. All right, that was temptation number uno, number one. And yeah, bottom line there, the devil you will use what he can, right? Um, whatever is the, the weakness, whatever he can exploit, he will certainly do so. Temptation number two, throw yourself from the temple. I don't know if this is a picture of the ancient temple. It's a picture of an ancient building. How about that? 
and it seemed to work. But the historian Josephus tells, that it's, tells us it was about 450 feet from the heights of the temple, which we don't see here, to the floor of the Kidron Valley. So outside the Temple Mount, it fell down drastically and there was the Kidron Valley. And if you jumped from the heights of the temple to the floor of the valley was about 450 feet. So what the devil is saying there to Jesus is um, throw yourself from the temple. And um, well, there was no chance that a, a normal person could survive that, right? But why would Jesus do such a thing? Well, the devil ups his game. He even quotes the Bible. Let's sneak back real quickly at that, that verse again. I should have included it there once again, maybe. But temptation number two, um, the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, there's that little word if again, uh, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So the devil says, throw yourself down or don't you trust God? So the first temptation was um, like a mistrust of God. Don't you trust God to provide for you and, and give you what you need? The second one is like this false trust um, that God will protect you no matter what even if you do something dangerous and obviously horrible, like jumping off the temple um, to your doom. But notice how the devil ups his game. Jesus quoted scripture and the devil's like, well, I can do that too. I can quote scripture and he quotes uh, the, the Bible back to him. Um, that's gotta be good, right? We're all suckers for that. When somebody quotes the Bible, it, it, must, be, it must be the truth, um, but not at all. You can easily misquote the Bible as well. There's a good lesson for us there too. Make sure we understand what the, the message actually is. But so here's the, here's the problem. It really is devilish to take a general promise of God that he cares for us. That's the promise, right? That, that verse that the devil quoted, that God will send his angels to, to care for you. It's a general promise that in our lives, God at times will protect us and provide for us through the use of his angels. He does not say any place that we can't get hurt, we can't fall and break our leg, we couldn't um, harm ourselves. Of course we can. Christians still get in car accidents. Um, Christians still have, have horrible things that happen to them physically and, and they die. Um, but at the same time, we also have the promise of God that in a general way, he cares for us and he provides for us. And what does the devil do? He takes that beautiful promise of God and twists it. He warps it. And he turns it into a threat. You better do this. God, you better do this. Jesus, you better trust God enough to jump off or don't you trust God? Don't you trust the Bible? Um, so that was temptation number two. Throw yourself from the temple. Uh, Jesus, in his response, do not put your Lord the Lord your God to the test, he's referring to the account of the Israelites demanding water from God during their 40 years of wandering. Um, they came to a place called Mara, there was no water, and rather than trusting that the Lord would provide for them, as he always did, think of the man, think of the quail, how God provided for them, instead they get angry and they start whining and they demand God to provide water for them. And the the Old Testament tells us that they tested God there um, at that place. So it wasn't God pleasing. It wasn't them asking, Lord, will you provide for us? It wasn't trusting them to provide. It was demanding or else. And Jesus refers to that. How does this apply to us? Um, let's talk a little bit about fatalism. Um, so, and I think Christians can fall into this pretty quickly and easily, and even sometimes think that they're being really strong in faith when they think this way. But fatalism basically believes that everything is determined and that our choices do not matter. And maybe you've thought this yourself or said this yourself. When your time is up, it's up, right? And there's some truth there. Certainly when God wants to take us home, he's going to take us home. But you understand how that can also get warped by us too. 
into us possibly cutting short our own time of grace that God has given to us by not caring for my body or not taking uh, safety precautions in life. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm fatalistic about things. And I don't think that the choices that I make have any impact in my life. And of course they do. So that's why I want to take good care of my body to the temple. I want to exercise. I, if I'm fatalistic, I would say, eh, it doesn't matter, right? Um, when your time is up, it's up. Doesn't matter if I exercise, doesn't matter what I eat or what I drink. Um, God's going to take me no matter what. Again, there's an element of truth. And I can be perfectly fit, absolutely, and God takes me home. But I can also shorten the time of my life by being foolish with my choices and being fatalistic about things. That's not great faith. Um, fatalism. It's um, really a putting God to the test and saying, God, you have to do this. Um, you have to provide for me um, without thinking that our choices matter at all. So there's a, a kind of a correlation there to, to us too and how that um, is a temptation. Similar to the false trust that the devil tried to tempt Jesus with. And temptation number three is to bow down and worship. So there we've got a picture of the devil. You've got uh, the little horn there. So that's got to be him. Scary looking dude. Um Temptation number three, the devil offers Jesus the easy way out, a different path than what he knows he has to face. So let me, forgive me for turning back here once more real quickly, but temptation number three, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and how that happened, we don't really know. You know, I think it was more than a vision, but in some way, um, and Jesus, of course, allows this. Jesus could have refused as God. So Jesus is allowing this to happen. Um, but he's taken there and showed all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. So somehow, again, this is some sort of supernatural type ability to see all of this. All this I will give you, the devil says, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. So again, bow down and worship, and I will give you all of these kingdoms and all of this world. So yeah, what is the devil offering? A different path, right? A different way for Jesus. No, Jesus, you don't have to suffer and you don't have to die. And if you just bow down and worship me, I, I will give you all of this splendor. And finally, he's lying again, right? He, he's offering something that he has no right to give. Uh, devil is still a liar. And sadly, we keep falling for it. We've touched on that already. But let's just be aware of the fact that the devil is going to continue to confront our sinful flesh. And he's going to continue to put out lies um, for us to believe. Um, again, that I don't have to listen to God or I'll be happier if I go my own path, or I don't listen to the word or whatever it might be. Um, life could be so much better, would be so much better if I could just do this. Um, one quick question. Could Jesus have fallen? Could Jesus have succumbed to the devil? It's a good theological question to consider. Um, the temptation was real. Absolutely. So what Jesus felt was real. The hunger and thirst that he felt were real because Jesus was a real human being. But we also have to say Jesus is God. Jesus could not go against his holiness. Jesus could not have sinned. Um, it's impossible for God to do so because he is pure and holy. Um, why did he go through it? Well, I think it's the same as the baptism to fulfill all righteousness. Why did the devil try? Um, because the devil is very clever and is good at, at tempting. But I think sometimes the devil is foolish too. He's an angel. He's a created being. And he's standing before the one who ultimately created him. So he has to know this is going to fail. Or maybe he didn't know that. Um, maybe he thought that he could kill 
um, God's answer to sin, much like King Herod when Jesus entered into the world to kill this baby. Um, the devil could get this Jesus to stray and that he had to try something, right? Because he knew the devil would defeat him. Excuse me. He knew that Jesus would defeat him, would defeat the devil. I shouldn't try to multitask. I just turned off my alarm with one second to go. The alarm, which would say, if I resume, the alarm would say, it is time for me to stop talking. I guess it wanted to keep going. So we have to wrap up here. I promise a half hour Bible study. Let's get to the end. So Jesus defeats the devil. His defense was very much the same each time. What did Jesus say to the devil? Um, Jesus turned the stones into bread. Jesus said, it is written. The devil said, jump from the heights of the temple, or don't you trust um, God to protect you? Jesus said, it is written. The devil said, uh, bow down and worship me, and I will give you all of these kingdoms. And Jesus said, it is written. Makes me think of Luther's, a mighty fortress is our God. Beautiful text, verse 3 says, Though devils all the world should fill, all eager to devour us. We tremble not, we fear no ill. They shall not overpower us. This world's prince, the devil, he may still scowl fierce as he will. He can harm us none. He's judged. The deed is done. One little word can fell him. I've thought about this before. Did Luther have in mind a word, an actual word? Or was he just saying in general, Jesus is so powerful, any little word of Jesus. I have a theory. I wonder. We can ask Luther this when we get to heaven. But... Um, did you have in mind one little word? And here's my theory. I wonder if Luther had in mind a specific word that can fell the devil. In Greek, the phrase, it is written, Jesus' answer here each time, it is written, it is written, it is written. Three words in English, right? In Greek, it is one word. Gegroptai. Gegroptai means it is written. Was Luther thinking of gegroptai? I wonder. Or was he thinking of just the name of Jesus? Or was he thinking of something else? I don't, I don't know. But um, that's my theory. I wonder, was he thinking of Jesus' response to the devil here? Because the words here fit really well for the temptation of Jesus, right? But bottom line, he can harm us none because the Savior has overcome him. Yes, we can still sin. We can still hurt ourselves. Um, but the devil is conquered. Jesus' defense is our defense. I know you've got to wrap up here. So what did Jesus say? It's not like Jesus defended himself by um, supernatural means. What did Jesus do? He went to the Bible. He went to the word. We've got the same defense that Jesus does. The devil cannot stand and he cannot stand up to the word of God. Like his baptism, Jesus is living under the law of God for us. That's why he went through that baptism to fulfill our righteousness. That's why he went through this temptation to live for us, part of being our perfect substitute. Jesus did not fall to the devil that day, nor did he fall any day. And our final thought, one little word of Bible truth is stronger than the lies of the devil. So when you are tempted, when I am tempted, God help us that we go to the word, not indulge our sinful flesh, but think of our Savior and his defense. And when we do fail and we do fall, because sadly we will, remember you have one who crushed the head of the devil when he died for your sins and when he rose again. So that is our comfort. The devil's judged and is defeated. We have the answers to help us in our temptation. We, our faith is in our Savior, and he gives us, he arms us with his word. God bless you in your faith, in your life of service to him. God bless you um, as we continue to face temptations in our lives. And uh, until next time, God be with you and um, look forward to our next, our next uh study that we have together. Thanks.